<laughs> hey, Ken. Well, I was going to be here to introduce you, so Oh, sure. Apologies. Oh, no, not to worry. Sorry for keeping you yeah. away. No. Did you already? Um, I've just been talking a bit about what brought me here to Portland. And, you know, we've only been here. My family and I have only been here for about two plus years. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. My apologies again. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, just two things by way of setup for the baby class uh, and then um, making sure that uh, Lloyd gets a proper introduction here. It's always hard to introduce yourself. Because <laughs> um, the things that are most important um, sound better when someone else is saying them. But, uh, but the desire with uh, the class this semester was, was just to be able to hit some different topics. And then with the elections going, with just the pace of what's happening in the world today, uh, to be able to, to kind of take some, some theology and, and look at how that really intersects with culture. And so um, we're, we're covering a lot of different things, all the way from um, <coughs> and archaeology uh, around Jerusalem and the temple to the Me Too movement. Uh, yeah, so there's just a, a lot of things in between. Um, so hopefully that'll be a fun teaser. Feel free to uh, bring uh, bring someone else uh, as long as we don't uh, get too many. Uh, I think we're all right, uh, but it's it's fun to have everybody here. Uh, but let me just say a few things about Lloyd. And he's kicking us off. Was good enough mm -hmm. to kick us off uh, and to do that. Um, but uh, it's kind of fun for me because I'm still getting to learn all the people that are in our church. And it's pretty remarkable when you run into people that. Uh, have their PhDs in philosophy and uh, were are the son of a seminary uh, president and lived overseas and all sorts of, of things and so it was kind of fun to um, connect with Lloyd and be able to invite him into this this uh, this series. But um, uh, Dr. Lloyd is is associate professor of social sciences uh, at Warner Pacific. Uh, so Dr. Chia was assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Global Studies and criminal justice at Spring Arbor University in Michigan prior to coming here. Uh, the son of a pastor and seminary president, um, Lloyd's lived most of his life in Singapore, uh, but has also spent time in Mongolia and New Zealand. Uh, so he has traveled widely in North America, Central America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Uh, he served as an officer in the Singapore Armed Forces, was a collegiate rugby player and coach, and performed as a vocalist for a band that produced two albums and toured extensively in Asia. Uh, he is a living Forrest Gump. <laughs> <laughs> his, uh, his ministry background includes serving as the worship director of All Nations Fellowship Multicultural Church in Columbia, Missouri, during his time at Spring Arbor uh, University. Uh, he's led cross-cultural studies trips to both China and Cambodia, uh, bringing students out to experience the world uh, as they study. Uh, he has published on the emerging church movement in America. He's researched the experience of LGBTQ students on Christian college campuses. Uh, campuses. He's also passionate about diversity, uh, faith relations, and racial reconciliation. Uh, his PhD in sociology from the University of Missouri, uh, a master's of social, uh, social sciences and sociology, and has a BA in sociology and history from National University in Singapore. Um, so it's fun to, to have our own scholars. We have so many in our midst. And then in this uh, course, there's also some uh, professors from Portland Seminary uh, that are going to scissor in as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back sure. over to you yep. and let you take it from there. Thanks for being here. Thanks. So I was giving a bit of an introduction about myself. And um, right now, I'm at Warner Pacific University in Southeast Portland. Um, it's a very exciting time to be at Warner. We were recently designated as uh, the only uh, four-year institution with a HSI or Hispanic Serving Institution designation. So there's been a huge push um, to serve the underserved. Um, we've lowered the tuition rate when other schools have, have uh, upped the tuition rate. And uh, there's a lot of energy on campus and it's, it's a great time to be at Warner. Um, and one of the reasons why I was brought to Warner was uh, because of the launch of uh, the new criminal justice major. Uh, I don't have a PhD in criminology. Uh, that wasn't what I studied uh, in grad school. Um, but they wanted somebody who had a strong uh, understanding of society, social institutions. Um, so uh, having that sociology was, was, was a good fit for what they wanted. And uh, I've been having a, a really wonderful time with the students in my criminal justice program. 
we just graduated our first criminal justice major last graduation and we have uh, a bunch more in the pipeline. A lot of them are um, going to do a lot of good in our world and uh, I'm very excited to be part of their journey. Um, part of what I'm teaching uh, today comes from a variety of courses that I've had to teach here at Warner in the past couple of years. One of the courses is criminology, the, the discipline of understanding why, why do people commit crimes. Um, an, uh, one of the other classes that I've had the privilege of teaching that uh, enabled me to cross paths with Greg, Greg Haskell, um, is a course on restorative justice that I taught last semester. Um, and so while this uh, lecture today is broadly on the role of the church in our justice system, uh, I, I'll be going into a lot about what this thing called restorative justice is and uh, that, that will help give us some idea on what, well, what, what does that point to in terms of what role the church can play. Um, so before I start, uh, I just wanted to start with uh, kind of like an anecdote. Uh, actually, this, uh, I, I got to credit this to Greg because I've actually never seen it before. But uh, in Oregon State Prison, there's a room, right? And it's a room that has like stacks and stacks of Bibles, okay? Tons of Bibles, so many Bibles um, to the point where uh, people have been told, stop, stop sending us Bibles. Like, we have enough, right? So this raises a question, uh, uh, an interesting question, right? Like, um, of course, who, who brought those Bibles there? Why, why are those Bibles there? What were those Bibles thought to be able to do? Uh, what were some of the assumptions behind uh, sending those Bibles and why are there so many of them, right? So it's, it's an interesting question as we think about um, in what ways uh, have Christians, in what ways has the church um, tried to do something about, uh, uh, try to meet the needs of prisoners and to do something about our justice system. So I just want to set that as like a, a, a quick backdrop. Um, I'll be covering... Uh, my lecture in five parts. So I'll be giving some uh, context into the justice system today. Um, and then uh, part two is kind of like a primer on this thing called restorative justice. Um, so keep in mind that uh, restorative justice is, a sem like I taught this as a semester long course at Warner. So it's, uh, you know, it was, it was really kind of like a struggle to try to boil it down to an hour and some, um, but I'll, I'll, I'm gonna try and do it. And then after part two, I'm gonna give us a bit of space to, to ask questions if you have any. Um, and then um, part three, we'll be talking about specifically about uh, re-entry. Uh, so when prisoners uh, finish their term and what are some of the challenges that they face re-entering into society. Um, and then part four really addresses kind of what, uh, what this topic is today about what the church can do. And then uh, part five is uh, an opportunity in Oregon uh, in relation to, to what the church can do in part four. So let me just uh, dive into it real quick. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit about the justice system today. Uh, so just take note, I'm not a the theologian. I'm not, uh, I, I wasn't trained in theology. And so um, th I'm, I'm taking this class kind of like according to, you know, my forte. Um, but th there will be an oppor opportunities for us to discuss, you know, what are, what are like the theological implications. And um, I, I just want to set some of the uh, background understanding of what we're looking at with our justice system today. So, um, Incarceration rates in America, in the United States of America, are really high. Um, we only have uh, less than 5% of the world's population, but we, uh, we have about a quarter of all the world's prisoners, right? So it's, uh, it's an interesting question of, um, do we just have really bad people? <laughs> or <laughs> or is, is there something more to that, right? Is it, is it more of a, a systemic issue? Um, and extending from that, there are other um, uh, there are other issues 
in terms of uh, the racial disparities that we talk about a lot in my classes, um, you know, just in terms of who, uh, who gets uh, caught up in the justice system and, and to what consequence, there are also issues related to what the uh, financial implications are for how much we're paying to keep people in prisons uh, as opposed to doing other things with them. Um, so this, this graph kind of puts uh, some of the uh, racial disparities about the prison systems into contrast, especially as it relates to um, time served and uh, the race of people uh, in, in terms of uh, how, how, wh what type of sentences they're serving, right? So as you can see, uh, it, it, this graph seems to suggest that uh, as a con convicted felon, if you are white, you would likely, you know, you'll be more likely to receive uh, the shorter end of the sentences um, as compared to if you were African American, right? So this is, uh, when we look at uh, the distribution of the prison sentences, this is one of, just one of the indicators, right? There are uh, plenty of indicators, not just at the level of incarceration. Uh, when we look at the justice system, we usually break it down to the, the area of law enforcement, uh, the courts, and then incarceration, right? So um, in the classes that I teach, we, we look at how at each point or at each uh, part of the criminal justice system, there are uh, disparities, right? In, in, in racial disparities in terms of how people are, uh, are treated at every, uh, in every sector of the justice system all the way to uh, when they land in prison. Um, when we think about uh, incarceration and the criminal justice system, uh, it's not just confined to what happens to prisoners, but we also think in terms of the social cost. What happens to the families of people who are incarcerated? Um, and a lot of times what you find is that um, when fathers aren't present, this only bodes uh, very badly for their children who don't have sufficient guidance, right? Um, so when you think in terms of uh, the, the effects of incarceration, uh, part of what we're really interested in also is what effect does that have not just on the, the people who are sitting in prison for uh, long bouts of their life, but also their family. Um, so this is some of the social cost that we look at, um, that uh, especially for me as a sociologist, when we look at particular institutions like the justice system, we look at it in relation to what, uh, what does this justice system do to the broader society, right? Um, also thinking in terms of uh, recidivism rates, I, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the term recidivism, but who goes back to prison, right? So um, one of the reasons why we have so many people in prisons is because people keep going back to prisons, right? The recidivism rate is uh, really high across the races. As you can see, um, over a five-year period, you have between 70 and 80% of all prisoners uh, returning right, uh, to prisons. So again, it, it begs the question, right? Uh, is there something wrong with people uh, or is there something wrong? Is there something systemically wrong? Right? And that's, that's essentially what I get my students to think about a lot as we examine uh, some of these issues. Something that I covered recently uh, with my uh, criminology students, I'm teaching criminology th this semester, so part of what we're doing is we're looking at the, the, the criminal justice system foundationally uh, and uh, figuring out why it does what it does. Um, and this pertains to what it's supposed to do. What, what, what are the goals of the justice system today? Um, and so my students and I, we had a discussion about this just a couple of weeks ago. These are the four goals of uh, the justice system. Okay, uh, It's designed to deter people, the first one. Uh, deterrence, 
which is uh, to prevent crimes by instilling fear so that people will not uh, break the law. Secondly, it's uh, incapacitation. When you're incapacitated, you're taken out of society, you're physically removed from society uh, through imprisonment so that you can't commit crimes and so that other people feel safe. Um, the third function or the third goal is rehabilitation. Um, so rehabilitation is, uh, is an attempt to reform the lawbreakers or the offenders. Um, and uh, the fourth goal is retribution, um, which is basically a, a form of payback, right? You've committed a crime, you do the time. So as I was talking about these four goals of the justice system to my students, one of the questions that I asked them was, well, in America's justice system, what do you think we're doing a really good job at? What do you think we're, we're, we're doing really well? And what are some things that we're uh, not doing so well in? Okay, and uh, by and large, I think um, my students were pretty much in consensus that we're pretty good at doing number two and number four. Okay, uh, that's why we have so many people sitting in prisons. Uh, we have been sort of getting tough on crime since uh, every president um, that's been in office. Um, and uh, we probably haven't been doing such a great job with, especially with number three, with rehabilitation. Um, and uh, deterrence is another issue that we've been talking about a lot in the justice system today. Uh, actually, deterrence is, is a huge, um, it's, it's, it's a huge ideology that's been driving the, the criminal justice system, right? Uh, to, uh, to deter people and uh, give them enough disincentive so that they will learn their lesson before they commit a crime and therefore not commit crimes. But um, deterrence is much more, uh, it's, it's a great idea, but it doesn't really work that well in practice. You know, that's part of what we've been talking about in class. So um, as we look at what the criminal justice system is trying to accomplish, it begs the question, has it really succeeded? Has it really been doing uh, well? Um, or what, what has it been not really doing well in, right? And uh, how does that work for people? Okay, so um, just as a quick uh, conclusion to this part, um, uh, the, the justice system often hurts more than it helps. And uh, we have a, a system that's designed to do things to people, right, in a, in a punitive kind of way, right? I punish you, I'm doing something to you, rather than uh, doing something for people, right? For being much more constructive, um, something positive, right? So um, we also have a criminal justice system that takes away people's agency. And this will get into some of the things uh, that are central to restorative justice that we'll get into. So when we say it takes away people's agency, uh, just for instance, uh, when we talk about uh, criminals or offenders, right? So when your agency is taken away, it means your ability to do something, your ability to act, to choose, to make uh, choices, that, that's taken away from you. Um, in my restorative justice class, we, just, we talk about how it's not just offenders who are left with little agency, you know, because they, they can't really, they're, they're just set aside, uh, put away in society. They don't really have a chance to uh, do something positive for themselves. And in the same way, actually, also victims of crimes are often sidelined, right? They don't really have a, a, a huge amount of choice or agency in uh, the things that they can say or do about their case. Uh, you know, it's kind of like the lawyers step in and they're just merely like a witness to the crime that was perpetrated against them. So that's what we mean by um, the ways that agency is taken away from people. Um, and this leads directly to, to the last point about how um, there's just a, too much burden on the justice system uh, for what, what it's trying to accomplish, right? Uh, in in uh, bringing about uh, peace and order um, 
in, in a society, right? This, is, this, this last point is something that my students and I at Warner came to a conclusion about as we uh, think about um, do, in order for us to be able to uh, address crime, uh, we, we might have to rethink some things uh, about the way that the justice system functions and the way that society, the role that other people in society play. And one of the conclusions that we came to is the last point here, that uh, people expect too much from the justice system. You know, it's kind of like in Singapore, we have a lot of teachers, uh, a lot of parents who give teachers a lot of flack for, you know, why isn't my kid learning this and that? Why isn't my kid uh, being responsible? What, what are you teaching my kid, right? But the burden of teaching, uh, of education, shouldn't just be on the teacher, right? There's a role that parents have to play. So this point is a bit about, uh, is, is akin to that, right? Um, when people want peace and security in society, they're expecting the justice system to take care of all of that. And we can just, you know, uh, stand aside as uh, observers uh, and you know the most we can do is uh, critique you know uh, but that's really you know uh, the job of law enforcement uh, that's really the job of the justice system to take care of uh, our sense of safety and uh, uh, security right so um, so that brings me to uh, a conclusion uh, of this first part of um, the, the lecture so far on some of the issues uh, facing the justice system, how we're looking at it, and uh, kind of like in the context, providing some context for what role the church can play. Um, so I'm gonna move into part two now and talk about uh, restorative justice, uh, which is kind of like a, a different approach to what you've heard uh, just now. Some of the language of restorative justice, uh, I, I don't know how, if you can see the terminology, some of the terms in here. Um, teaching this class last semester gave me a lot of hope, right? Um, a lot of what I teach is about what, what's systemically wrong in society, right? Um, but teaching restorative justice was in, in, in a way of a breath of fresh air because uh, it, it, it was, it was uh, for me and my students, it was something that was, uh, there was a lot of talk of what we could do to change things. Um, language and terms, as you'll see here, like uh, healing, uh, rehabilitation, uh, redemption, redeeming. Right, a lot of a lot of the language of restorative justice is is stuff that we we talk about a lot in our own Christian faith. Right, um, um, in this lecture, I've also integrated uh, some of my students' uh, work, some of my students' assignments, um, to to give you an idea of what the students are saying about res restorative justice as they're thinking about. Um, uh, all the material that they've learned over the, cross, uh, over, uh, the course of a semester. Okay, um, so one of my students uh, talks about rest restorative justice as, a, as the practice of finding restoration through uh, involvement of victims, offenders, communities in the process of finding true justice. Okay, uh, it gives offenders opportunities to change their character uh, it helps build an understanding of a crime, uh, empathy as well, understanding of what their crimes have done to other people, um, and uh, to understand their past, face their demons, and what has happened that have shaped them into who they are today. So that's what one of my students said. Um, another student said, all of us are capable of making mistakes that can change our lives, but all of us are also worthy of being restored. And that's, that's at the heart of restorative justice. A slightly longer quote uh, from a student who, I thought for, the, most of, for most of the class, I thought she was like asleep <laughs> and disengaged. But when I read her stuff, I was like, whoa, okay. 
Um, so, and she, I, I actually told her, uh, she, I, have, I have her in a class this semester, and I actually told her that I was going to feature some of her work, and uh, I think she was, she felt pretty stoked about that. So, um, she said, to me, restorative justice is about more than just the punishment. Um, it's about addressing the harm done to individuals and communities, and also recognizing that offenders are human, and humans make mistakes, and they can learn from them. Offenders have a chance to make amends or pay back uh, harm if that's what's needed. Um, to make a change in how they act, right? So that, 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 that issue of agency. Um, and they have an opportunity to become uh, contributing members of society. And so uh, for my student, uh, restorative justice is a way to address the issues of crime and attempt to make changes rather than just putting people in the can and thinking that they will just somehow automatically uh, realize the folly of their ways and, and come out as like changed people like ramen, you know. <laughs> it's done, right? <laughs> okay, um, so uh, just through the words of my students, I, I hope to give you, have given you some flavor of what restorative justice is all about. Um, uh, into some of uh, the, oh, sorry, it's a bit to, to that side, but um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, certain features of restorative justice. Um, and I'll give us uh, a bit of space after this part of the lecture to ask questions, to clarify, uh, because you know, uh, some of this we covered like I said, through the course of the semester, and I'm just trying to like boil it down. Um, so the, the four features of restorative justice are, the first one is inclusion, uh, the second one is encounter, the third one is amends, and the fourth one is reintegration, right? So um, the inclusion aspect, uh, as I said, addresses the, the agency, the lack of agency, right? So include, uh, rest restorative justice is meant to be inclusive. It's meant to, uh, give people an opportunity to participate, even victims of crimes, even offenders, even uh, community members, right? It's, it's an attempt to, uh, to lay a, a big table for people to come and to, to address uh, issues of crime and wrongdoing in society, right? Um, so there's an active participation component of it. For encounter, um, encounter is basically the opportunity to bring people together, okay? Um, and that's what restorative justice tries to do. Um, it, it even tries to bring offenders and victims together, right? So um, it's, it sounds uncomfortable and actually my students, uh, when we first got into restorative justice, they, they struggle with some of these concepts, right? It just doesn't sound like it's gonna be doable or viable. Right? If somebody's experienced a crime and a trauma, the last thing they will want to do is to come face to face with their offender. Right? Um, it's almost like a re-traumatization. But um, as we've gone into this a bit deeper, um, uh, we, we found that uh, bringing people together uh, in conjunction with giving them agency, in, in giving them the ability to have a say, uh, is an important part of uh, restored, restoring relationships and, and healing crimes and wrongdoings that have been done interpersonally. Um, the third aspect, uh, third feature of restorative justice is making things right, is amends, right? Making things right. Um, yes, the justice system can give out harsh sentences to people. It can put them away for a really long time. Uh, in, in the case of three strikes rule, you know, you can be put away for 25 years to life just for uh, a minor third offense. And, um, but, you, but none of that enables you to make things right. All you're doing is sitting in jail or you're, you're, you're not able to uh, make reparations or make, uh, make amends for the things that you've done wrong, right? And restorative justice thinks that um, that's, that's an important part of, uh, of restoring offenders, right? To give them an opportunity to make things right. 
And then, of course, uh, the last feature of restorative justice, its goal is to reintegrate people into society. It's to bring people back, right? It's, it's to help people return to society, okay? Um, so these four features of restorative justice, um, these are some, uh, some of the ways that each of these have been, uh, are, are brought to life, right? How restorative justice is implemented or what this looks like practically, right? So when we talk about uh, inclusion and, and turning people from passive to active participants, um, one of the examples that I have is uh, something called victim impact statements. So even when victims don't want to have interactions with the perpetrator, um, what they can do is they can write statements or, or tell them this is the effect of the crime that you committed against me and, and how it's hurt me, right? So victim impact statements can be done in many ways. Sometimes it's face to face, sometimes it's not. But the key point is that um, the, the victim becomes an active participant, right? They're able to do something uh, about, uh, about the wrongdoing that was done to them without just keeping it inside. Uh, and then in terms of encounter and in terms of bringing people together, things like mediation and conferencing uh, are, are basically ways that um, not just offender and uh, victim are brought together, but school counselors, pastors, law enforcement, people from the community. Um, so that, that's, that's with mediation and conferencing. One of the things that my students had to do in my restorative justice class was to do a role play. So uh, some students did a role play about bu school bullying. And so they had to role play uh, an, an, an example of a mediation where you had a school counselor or a principal who was a mediator between, uh, be between uh, uh, kids that, that were caught up in a, a bullying incident, right? And then conferencing, um, I guess in popular culture, we have things like you know, intervention, right? So where you know, family, family members come and you, you, you really have this community response uh, to, to wrongdoing. And then um, the third one for amends, making things right, there's an emphasis on being able to pay back, uh, being able to, as much as possible, undo the harm that was done. Not, it's not always possible um, to undo the harm uh, uh, you know, for instance, in uh, certain, certain sex crimes or uh, uh, physical assault, but maybe in terms of property crimes, right, you, you could uh, try to repay back um, what you stole or took. Um, and then, of course, the reintegration aspect is uh, the ability to return um, to society, return to work, return to your family, uh, get back to your community, right? Um, so that, these are just some uh, cornerstones of restorative justice and what that looks like in practice in the brackets, right? Um, this is a graph that um, it's, 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 it just kind of gives, gives you an, an idea of um, ways that restorative justice is done, what it does for victims, offenders, uh, and the role of the community, and then uh, this is, th this is sort of the, the different degrees of uh, how restorative something is. Uh, so, so those on the outer circle are par partly restorative. I think one of the things, um, you don't have to remember this whole thing, um, but one of the takeaways that my students and, and I have had about restorative justice is that it's not, it's not a programmatic, rigid, like 12 steps, right? Restorative justice is something that's meant to be flexible. It's, it's meant to be um, uh, approached differently depending on whether we're talking about school students, right? depending on whether we're talking about offenders. So restorative justice is meant to be flexible. It's meant to be adaptable um, not, rather than dogmatic. So another quote from my students is, uh, this is the student who was who I thought was asleep most of the time, right? Um, uh, restorative justice creates a real sense of responsibility in the offender through having them carry out reparations, uh, pushing accountability past just uh, going to jail, right? 
And so uh, my student said, I see a real ability to make a difference further than just in the lives of the people direct directly involved in a criminal case. Uh, I think that restorative justice can truly rebuild communities, right? So it's like, it's not just, the potential of restorative justice is not just to reform offenders, but it, it has the potential to, um, to rebuild communities. One of the books that I made my students read um, was this book by uh, a journalist named John uh, Hubner or Hubner um, called Last Chance in Texas. Um, so it's centered on a, a facility, a, a youth juvenile facility in uh, Giddings, Giddings, Texas. Um, and what they do with uh, the, the young offenders who, ha who go through this program, um, not everybody's allowed to go this, through this program, only some of them, only some are. You have to go through a lot of tests to get to this point. And they're a part of a, you could call it like an ac accountability group. And what they do is a lot of role play. What they do is uh, to, uh, they're forced to confront the actions that they've committed in the past. So part of the role plays uh, ask them to uh, reenact the crime they, they perpetrated. And then uh, they would then have to reenact the crime and play the victim. Right? So it, it helps create empathy. You know, uh, it helps them realize the harms that they committed to other people and what it was like to be in the shoes and uh, of the person who experienced the crime. Um, these sessions are very emotionally taxing and draining um, to both the, uh, the counselors and the people who are doing it as well as to the, the, the juveniles. And um, it's a long drawn process. Uh, it's, it, it happens over time um, and people drop out. Uh, it's not easy to have to face your own demons. It's not easy to have to uh, gain empathy, right? And also um, to look at yourself in the mirror uh, and, and not sort of want to uh, escape from from reality, right? So they're, they're basically forced to confront themselves. And that actually addresses one of the reservations that a lot of my students had about uh, restorative justice. Um, it, isn't it gonna be an easy way out for people? Isn't, isn't it gonna be an easy way out for criminals, right? Just to get a slap on the wrist. If they know this program or this option exists, well, maybe they can game the system and pretend to be good and pretend to go through this process so that they can get out quickly, right? Um, but one of the things that we learned uh, in reading uh, Last Chance in Texas is that it's, it's, not, it's not easy, right? Actually, actually it is easy um, in a sense that it's a lot easier for a person to sit in, in, in prison and not have to assess themselves than it is to have to confront your, your own demons and to, to, to change, right? So that's, um, that's one of the things that we concluded, right? Um, and, and a lot of my students wrote about this because a lot of them did have reservations about restorative justice as we started the course, right? Um, that it was an easy way out. And furthermore, uh, it takes time, right? It takes time to bring change. Um, last thing I'll say is that uh, for this part is that uh, restorative justice is not just a system, it's not a, a rigid program, but it's a, a fundamental way of humanizing people um, to see their mistakes and uh, to enable them to grow from them, right? Um, even though it's not something that is easy, uh, it's going to be uh, it, it's, it, it still is something that has to be done and it requires time, flexibility, commitment, and hope, right? So this is, these are the words of um, some of my students who, uh, who had initially expressed skepticism about restorative justice and then, and then toward the back end of the course realizing that um, it, it, it does work um, to bring about change in people, but it does require commitment, it does require hope, um, it's not an easy process. Um, 
So at this juncture, I'd just like to uh, pause and um, firstly ask uh, if, you, if anybody has any questions so far. And then um, I'm going to give a bit of time for you to, uh, in, your, in your tables um, to uh, talk about these two questions. Um, what aspects of restorative justice do you think are consistent with biblical teaching? And um, what sort of reservations or misgivings might you have about uh, what I've presented so far uh, about restorative justice? So uh, let me just go ahead and ask if you have, if, if you have any questions so far. Um, yes. Yeah. That, um, are more restorative. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, Greg and I attended a transformative justice uh, seminar uh, that was held at Willamette University. And one of the really good student presentations was on the Nor Norwegian model and, and how uh, that, you know, it, it's basically uh, it, it, just in terms of how they, their, their whole justice system is very restoratively oriented and it has. You know, it has great, great results. So there are countries, there are countries that um, are more restorative than others in terms of uh, what they do with their offenders and prisoners. Yeah. Yes. So one question for that would be: Norway is a pretty homogenous country. The United States is not. So mm -hmm. How well would those principles apply to a country that doesn't have some of the um, yeah. cultural things like the Norway does? Um, sure. That's. That, I, I think that's a big question. Um, uh, you know, and, and I think uh, we heard from the transformative justice presentation that there were, there were people from the Oregon prison systems who were getting acquainted and, and actually going over to Norway to see how they run things, right? So even though, the, you know, the, the cultural equivalent may never be perfect, but uh, hopefully for people who uh, are able to make those decisions, uh, I mean, some, some of the things I think Will transcend, uh, will transcend people's culture because because we're talking about what people need for them to thrive, right? And uh, hopefully some of that, you know, I, I think some of that trans it's it's about what people need to be able to to thrive and do well, right? Um, so I, I believe that some of that can transcend like the the cultural differences, yeah. Um, so one of, one of the things that you were talking. Mm -hmm. Seems like our, our culture has been moving more in a direction of uh, less um, flexibility. So Measure 11, for example, sets requirements. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a lot of zero tolerance. For yeah. In yeah. Schools and, right. And so that's moving kind of in the opposite direction of, of uh, making judgments in uh, yeah. particular cases. Um, yeah. Why do you think that is, and then what? How can that be changed? Um, the 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 punitive turn. I, I think that's sort of the the frame of mind that people have, you know, uh, uh, towards crime. Like we just need harsher sentences, and we need to come down harder on people so that it will deter them. But it doesn't get to some of the the root issues or the root causes of wrongdoing and crime in society, right? So um, it does it like it doesn't surprise me that um, laws are getting harsher because they've always gotten harsher. But I also think that there is a movement, um, especially uh, th there is a movement um, at least uh, in consistent with the way that we approach uh, our criminal justice majors in getting them to think about what works and what doesn't work and what have been some of the unintended consequences of uh, overly harsh uh, laws. Um, and I think Measure 11 is something that we, we have talked about. And some of my students have worked on projects, you know, with regard to like what, what have been some of the effects on Measure 11 and what can, uh, what it's done to people and what can, what can be done differently. Part of what gives me hope as a professor is that I know that some of these students of mine are going to be, uh, decision makers in the justice system for the future. So um, in my role as a professor, th that's the way I see the change happening in, in terms of the knowledge and the critical approach to the justice system that they can bring with them into their professions in the justice system. 
so I think there is there is a change um, there is a change uh, afoot and uh, there's a book that I uh, assigned to one of my classes some of you may have heard of it before it's called um, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander um, it's The New Jim Crow and uh, it it's sort of a she, she's a legal scholar but she does a very good job of breaking down uh, some of the uh, some of the injustices and inequities in in the criminal justice system, and and th this has as a New York Times bestseller, right? The New Jim Crow has sort of been a tool to educate uh, people who are not uh, just looking at it academically, right? So I think um, there is a broader cultural shift um, for everything from like incarceration, uh, how something needs to be done about incarceration, where uh, it, it almost seems like both sides, both Democrats and Republicans, are recognizing that the the way we do incarceration in in in, in um, America hasn't been working very well, and it's and the financial costs and the societal costs are outweighing the benefits that that we thought we could accrue by by being by sending to people to prison for a really long time, right? So I think uh, culturally uh, there's a shift. Uh, um, so I'm hopeful. I guess what I say is I, I'm hopeful, um, and more so I think in this state than than in many other states. Yeah. Yes. So last chance. In, in Texas, yeah. Uh, I don't know what the book concludes with, but did it measure recidivism rates? Yes. Then, yeah. What yeah. What was the conclusion? Um, the conclusion is that it works. Yeah, it works. The conclusion is that it works. Uh, um, uh, there, there is an article. Um, let's see, did I? Yeah, there's an article that. Um, but it's it's not just uh, sort of anecdotes or or newspaper uh, coverage about the program and how it's worked. I think if you go, uh, my students even went to the Department of Justice Texas uh, website where they have a whole report on the Giddings program and, and sort of the, the success uh, in terms of the recidivism rates, right? But, but one of the issues that we talk about is that even though Giddings is a success test case, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of infrastructure and money put into it in, to make it happen, right? And so the, it, it becomes a question of like, can it be replicated or can it be generalized? Can it be scaled, right? And that, that's a big question, right? Because you, you do have places where it seems to have worked really well, but it's, the other question is whether it can be scaled and generalized. Uh, and and uh, I, I don't think we're there yet, but um, the more, you know, uh, we, we need places that do things differently, that set an example, um, for for the rest of society in terms of how we could do things. I mean, I guess a crude example would be with like uh, the legalization of marijuana, right? Uh, one state comes out and does it and then everybody's like, bad things are going to happen to your state. And then when they see the tax dollars come in, other states are like, whoa, okay, well, you want some of that, so let's do it, you know? So <laughs> so sometimes, um, s sometimes the 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 people who put their necks out and try something new um, will, will be important examples for the people who are, are looking for ways to do things differently. Yeah. Offenders mixed together with, you know, uh, recent offenders and they're... Influenceable. Right, exactly. So they, they, you know, you think prisons are there to reform people, but, but they end up educating people on how to commit crimes better. You know, so... People. Do, do our prisons doing what they're supposed to do, right? Um, so I want to give you guys, uh, everybody, a chance to just uh, talk to each other around the table about these two questions. Um, uh, and that way I can take a break for my voice. Too. <laughs> so yeah, just go ahead. Uh, I, I th maybe you, you guys can jo join with another table. Um, yeah, so... So just back to the drawing board real quick. Um, we've covered part one and two. I'm going to switch gears a bit for this third part, uh, talking about the challenges of re-entry because it relates directly uh, to part four and part five. 
Of course, restorative justice uh, can be practiced um, not just at the point of when prisoners are re-entering into society, right? Um, but that's what uh, I want to focus on today. Um, so just uh, a bit about the challenges of re-entry. What uh, are some challenges that people face when they're being released from prison, right? Um, it's hard, right? Um, it's like you're naked and blindfolded and being shot into a brick wall by a cannon. Um, you, don't, you haven't necessarily been equipped uh, and uh, depending on how long of a sentence you've served, uh, society out there may have changed from what you were living in uh, decades ago. Um, these are some of the needs uh, or some of the issues that people have. Uh, substance abuse, mental health issues, um, educational deficiencies, uh, lack of employment. Being, uh, I mean, employment in particular is really, really hard for people to get jobs when they have a felony on their record and you have to, you know, tick or fill in that box, right? So that's, um, that's, that's really hard. It's, it's, it's even hard for people to get uh, a place to live. Um, to be able to uh, apply for a, a, a place to rent, right, to live if you, you have a record. Uh, who, you know, you can imagine how hard it is for people to um, get a place even to live. Um, these are some of the different re-entry needs that people have in the short term and long term, as we've, some of which we've talked about. Um, safe housing, clothing, medical care, uh, recovery from substance abuse, um, and if you don't have something positive to go to in the short term, then you might go back to what you knew, right? And that's not really going to help you very much either. Um, and so if you think about these issues related to re-entry and the difficulty of re-entering to society, and if you think about uh, the recidivism rate, you know, it, it, gives you, it, it, it can give you a sense of like why uh, people go back to prisons and why recidivism, recidivism rates are so high across the races um, when they don't get uh, their needs met. Um, and so this brings me to part four of uh, what the church can do. Um, I came across uh, this uh, article uh, from the Baylor Center of uh, Christian Ethics uh, about... <coughs> how um, a lot of times Christians don't think uh, anything needs to be done. Um, and they, uh, Christians are the ones who support the highly retributive uh, penal system, right? And there's no tension uh, between that and uh, what they see as uh, scriptures call uh, to practice forgiveness and reconciliation, right? Um, so uh, another uh, Another quote that I'm taking from the textbook my students use in our class, um, <clears throat> this idea of uh, how Christian churches, faith communities, uh, have often been better at proclaiming love than demonstrating it. You know, I, and I think that's something that Greg just uh, made a reference to uh, in terms of like the preaching to prisoners that, that goes on in expectation that that will somehow magically transform them, right? Um, but the authors of this book um, <clears throat> nevertheless think that there's been a, there's been a strong and extensive history of involvement uh, with those in need, the church, right? And it's uh, traditions that speak of both the call and the resources to undertake, to do this work. Uh, and the other thing is that it, it's present in virtually every part of the world um, that makes it a promising agent of reintegration, right? So um, this, is a, this is kind of like a brief summary of what I think the church can do to restore offenders and why the church is so suited um, to, do, to do this hard work. Um, firstly, it's presence, right? Uh, local churches are everywhere across America. There are something like 350,000 uh, congregations uh, or actually more. Maybe that's den denominations. The, the thing is that there are a lot of Christians, <laughs> a lot of local congregations spread out throughout the United States. So we are everywhere, 
right? Um, we have a presence, right? Um, we know the power of relationships, right? We know the power of social support. Um, I mean, we know it so well that even if it's, we're talking about, you know, mega churches have figured out that we need small groups. Uh, Village has figured out that we need ethnic fellowships, right? Um, so we, we know how to do relationships, whatever the scale of our, our congregation size or fellowship is. We figured it out, right? Um, and so that, that forebodes well because we know the power of social support. Um, in terms of expertise, think about the number of trained professionals, um, business owners. Uh, we, we have a lot of highly skilled people very knowledgeable people uh, within the walls of the church. Uh, I bet you, you know, if I asked, are there any social workers, teachers, like there are going to be all of these people, psychologists, right? All of these like helping professions and more are going to be uh, within the walls of the church. Um, fourthly, accountability, right? Um, we're great at uh, talking about discipleship, we're great with walking uh, people through their relationship with God in terms of uh, providing moral, moral and spiritual guidance and care. And that's, that's what offenders need, right? Um, and of course, uh, it, meeting practical needs of people, right? The practical and material help that, that people, and we're doing this at Village, right? Uh, in, in a lot of ways uh, with uh, meeting the practical needs of uh, trafficking victims, of immigrants, like we, we do this, right? Um, so transformation and redemption is, is really like the church's forte. It's, it's something that, w it's, it's, it's our bread and butter, all right? So that's why I think there, there's a lot that uh, churches can do to restore offenders. The last part uh, that I'm going to be talking to you about is an opportunity in Oregon. Um, and so what could this look like um, for a church like Village? And uh, I don't know if any of you have heard about uh, the Portland Leadership Foundation uh, and uh, Ben Sand. He, is, uh, he's he works very closely with our president at Warren Pacific College uh, University, um, Dr. Andrea Cook. And um, the Portland Leadership Foundation has done a lot of great work uh, in, in terms of child welfare. And they recently wrote uh, this re-entry uh, project uh, concept paper um, with, with the intent of uh, doing something about prisoner re-entry in the state of Oregon, uh, employing <coughs> community support for uh, ex-offenders. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to present here is, is taken from that report. Um, so. The problem with re-entry, you know, uh, what I've talked about, um, you know, in terms of the resources that people aren't given with when they're released from prison, and uh, thinking about the, the problem of homelessness that we talk about so much in Portland, uh, it shouldn't surprise us that a lot of uh, <coughs> ex-felons go from prison to homelessness. Um, so that, that is pretty... Uh, it's pretty sobering to think that that's happening, right? If I, I just yeah. throw in an observation there, that is not true in Multnomah County. It is very true in Washington County. That is, Multnomah County does pretty good at housing uh, men released from prison. Washington County does very bad at that. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Um, so more from the re-entry project, um, what they intend to do is they want to mobilize community crews to love formerly, formerly incarcerated Oregonians, um, developing a collective impact effort that networks individuals, families, faith communities, organizations, uh, and the government. They want, what they want to do is they want to mobilize the community to engage with 240 women uh, that are being released from Coffee Creek uh, in 2020 and 2021, as well as their children. So they want to be involved with these women uh, as well as their children. <coughs> um, 
so again, some of the goals uh, to uh, bring along the community to walk alongside these Oregonians attempting to successfully re-enter into the neighborhood after incarceration. And so the aim is to dramatically decrease recidivism um, and to incre uh, decrease recidivism while increasing uh, the number of Oregonians who are involved relationally with people uh, who are for formerly incarcerated. Uh, at the conclusion of the report, uh, the Portland Leadership Foundation report, um, th this is what it says. Our research spells out a deep truth. The public does not demonstrate compassion or forgiveness when an Oregonian experiences corrections. Um, the evidence is found in how we have ignored the challenges of women and men faced uh, when leaving incarceration. We draw the conclusion that re-entry is not an isolated government problem. This is a neighborhood problem. This is an Oregon problem. Uh, the time has come to do something about it. So this is kind of like Portland Leadership Foundation's call uh, for people to get involved with this project that involves um, everybody uh, that has backing from uh, Department of Justice and uh, also uh, an organization called OJRC, Oregon Justice Resource Center. Um, and they want to mobilize the community uh, to help uh, these 240 women uh, being released from Coffee Creek uh, prisons and, and their family. So my closing question uh, is, <clears throat> does the church have a role to play in our justice system today? Given what we just talked about with regard to the needs of re-entry, uh, the re-entry needs of ex-prisoners and what Portland Leadership Foundation is, is trying to do with this project, what would villagers' involvement with pre prisoner re-entry look like? Um, and then thirdly, what do you think makes village suited or unsuited uh, for involvement in uh, Portland Leadership Foundation's re-entry project? Uh, let me just say I have no affiliation with uh, Portland Leadership Foundation, as in um, part of what they want to do is that they, they also want to overturn or address people's misperceptions of uh, prisoners. Um, and uh, my, the president uh, of my college told me about this re-entry project and that uh, Ben San had, had written this paper. And so I read it. And I was like, wow, you know, um, in conjunction with what, what I'd just been teaching uh, at Warner with restorative justice, uh, uh, and then thinking about the intersection of like what the church can do, right? Um, and then um, when Yena and uh, Ken uh, asked me about something that I could speak on, I mean, it's like the pieces were all there. <laughs> So I'm not affiliated with Portland Leadership. In fact, Ben San probably doesn't even know that I'm presenting on this paper. Um, and, uh, but, but this is a project that they're gonna be launching this year uh, or uh, they're, they're ramping up to launch this project. And they want communities uh, to get involved. They want churches like Village uh, with people, resources to be involved, right? Um, so what, what do you think Village can do? Yeah. That's what I'll leave you with. <laughs> <laughs>